what was Flatbush like when you were? Uh, when, I, when I moved in, we spent a lot of time playing. Uh, I was, you know, five, six at the time. So uh, before I was ten, I spent time playing with the kids on the block. We used to play Skelly, which was a popular Brooklyn game with bottle caps. What is that? How do you play that? Uh, Skelly is a, a game uh, with nine boxes and it has a, within a box and you have a middle box which has the number 10 in it and that's the final number you have to achieve okay. and around the box is a, a, another square which just has a border and if you fall into that border you're out until somebody shoots you to get you out. Is it playing with marbles? No, you play with bottle caps. Oh, bottle caps, you said that. Bottle Sorry. caps. And uh, you would start at one, and you would go to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you would try to get in there. In order to move, if you, if you shot your bottle cap and it landed within the box of one, you were able to go to the two. If you landed in the two, you were able to go to the oh, three. Okay, so. But if you didn't land and you landed on the line or outside the line, the next person that came, they could either shoot for the two or the, the bottle cap and hit you, they automatically went into the box. Okay. So you would do that all the way up to number nine, and then uh, to, uh, number nine, and then to reach the middle of the board, which was drawn in chalk, uh, you would get into the ten. Once you became, went into the ten, you became a killer diller, <laughs> and that means that you would have to eliminate everybody on the board to be the winner, and you you would be able to shoot. And, you know, once you shot your opponent, you had to hit them three times, and then they were out. Once, two, three. Oh, kind of like pool, right? Yeah, so it's sort of like a pool game and stuff like that. But it was a street board game on, it was better played on the street uh, surface because it was a uh, blackboard uh, surface. It was slate, so the chalk stayed to the slate very well. And we used to melt crayons into our bottle caps to give them color and weight so that when we were shooting them, we would be able to shoot the, the, you know, the opponents to so move. So the melt, the slate, that was a board that you brought with you? or No, we drew it with chalk right on the side. Okay, on the side. Right in the street. Right in the street, Between, yeah. between two cars or something like that. Oh, okay. So. And the, 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 the thing of the game was to go up to 10, mm -hmm. avoid the area around the 10, which would put you out. Right. You lose, would lose your turns you lose until somebody got you out. Or if you got into that and luckily you landed on the line, you were safe. But if you were in the, within that area, which would have been like this, or the, the triangle, a place like this, the 10, and if you landed in the area, you were out. Okay. That sounds great. So when you were little, do you remember going to the movies? Or was that something you did when you were a teenager? Uh, then I was very curious about, I, I like to have money. So uh, okay. they, there was a job at a butcher shop on Nostrand Avenue. And he needed someone to deliver orders, uh, meat orders after school. So, you know, How I happened to. Huh? How old were you? I was 10 at the time. So. What? I got the job in 1966, and I worked there till 1969. And uh, I basically, after school between three and five, and then between six and seven, I would deliver meat orders. And I used to, my 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 pay was like my tips. So by the end of the week, I could you know rustle up something like. Twelve dollars in tips, and I was paid to work Saturday from nine to six, and I got paid ten dollars for that. Oh, so you only got paid on the Saturday? Yeah. And the rest it was just tips. Right. And then on Sunday was my movie day, uh, but I had attended movies with my. Prior to that, I attended movies sporadically with my sister, and we went to the Granada, which was on Church Avenue between Rogers and Nostrum. So that was my first movie house experience, and I, I remember seeing. Mary Poppins, Blackbeard's Ghost, uh, Happiest Millionaire. Most of the Disney shows at the time were shown at the Granada. Jungle Book, especially Jungle Book, uh, played in like nine weeks, eight weeks. And mm -hmm. that's where I got caught with the movie bug. So every 
when I worked every Sunday, which was the day of rest for everybody, I would eat my noontime meal. We had, you know, Europeans eat their big meal at 12 noon. So after one o'clock, or after I was done, as fast as I was done, because the Granada always started at one o'clock, I used to fly out the house and get to the box office before they opened up. And uh, I started going weekly until I discovered there were more theaters on Flatbush Avenue. And then once I noticed that there were more theaters on Flatbush Avenue, I started going to all of them. So how many theaters were there in this area? In the vicinity, at that time, there were six operating theaters in 1970, 1968. Was, there were six operating theaters. And uh, uh, 10 years er earlier, it would have been about 15 or 16 theaters. Really? Yes. Yeah, there were theaters more closer to my house that had closed, and some on Flatbush that had closed, Six. some beyond the Rialto that had closed. So you were saying before that that was the, because of the advent of television? That In 1953 is when they started closing up, and some of them hang on, hung on till the end of the decade, uh -huh. the 50s. Um, but the, I don't remember any of those. Uh, you know, I've seen them since then in pictures and slides because of my curiosity always led me to want to see what I hadn't right. witnessed. Yeah. And that's what led me to, you know, you know, well, do the studies on theaters and stuff because I was always curious about how many theaters Brooklyn had. Uh -huh. And when I got older, I finally did the reference to find out that Brooklyn had in their neighborhoods approximately 350 theaters. Wow. More than Manhattan. Really? Uh, yes, because we were the fourth largest city at the time. And uh, movie going was very popular with the Brooklyn folks. And I also remember an instance where when we were kids, before I got the job, whenever we would go to a movie with my friends and stuff, because we were all like 10 and under, and in those days we did go by ourselves. Our parents didn't take us anywhere. None of our parents. So we would take walks up uh, Nostrand Avenue to Eastern Parkway, and on Eastern Parkway and Nostrand was a theater called the Cameo Theater. And uh, we got in, used to get in for 50 cents, and so double features. And uh, the first one that I remember vividly is uh, Elvis Presley in Frankie and Johnny and Duel at Diablo, James Gardner was the double feature. Oh, and we went there a couple of more times until our parents, all our parents, found out that we were going up to Bedford Stuyvesant to see movies. Uh -huh. So that was quickly, you know, snuffed out. And then we were told what theaters, basically later on in walks, what theaters we could attend and not attend. Okay. <laughs> um, where was your family from? You said European background. Yes, my my parents were from Portugal, and. Uh, you know, my dad passed away when uh, I was a year old, and uh, my mother remarried in 60. And uh, up to that time, when I was a young one, uh, my mother used to tell us that, you know, it's her and her friend we used to go shopping downtown Brooklyn, that we always went to the Brooklyn Fox, the Paramount, and the Albee, which were the prime areas in downtown Brooklyn shopping area. Uh, because that area was, at that time, was like the Times Square of New York. Oh, okay. Okay, and all our activity, we, no, we didn't have to leave Brooklyn because we had a Brooklyn Paramount, just like New York had a Paramount. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, all those theaters, well, at the time of their operation, were all first-run theaters. Oh, excuse me, I have to get this because it's... I'm starting again. Um. Okay. So the movies pretty much got into my blood and I enjoyed going to the movies. And then when I found out that the theaters on Flatbush Avenue were first run theaters, I started going to them because they were the same price as the Granada, you know, and it was 75 cents for children 11 and under. Mm -hmm. But since I was so small, I, I used that ploy till about I was 14 going on 15, I was still able to get in for the children's price. Mm -hmm. But in 1968, they started the rating system, 
which when they started writing the movies G, M, R, and X. And uh, when I would go to the Kings to see maybe Flare Up with Raquel Well, she was rated M. So uh, the, the, they would walk, see you, they would let you go in, but they would ask you how old you were. And, uh, <laughs> and to, I said, 15. <laughs> And so they said, but what did you hear weeks ago and told us that you were <laughs> under 12? Yeah. So I was caught eventually with that game and stuff. And then, you know, uh, I was always pretending to be 16 so I could get into all the R-rated movies that I wanted to see. But it didn't make a difference because at the Granada, they were very lenient. And as long as you had your 75 cents, you, you got it. Okay. You know, ratings weren't a problem. <laughs> and at the Granada, you worked as a candy boy? At the Granada, I was a candy boy, and I started working there in 1970. And how did that work? Did you work behind the counter? Yeah. I worked behind the candy okay. counter, and our candies were priced uh, unbelievable to believe at this time, but everything was 10 cents to 45 cents for a box of raisinets, uh, which now have climbed tenfold. <laughs> in price, and our popcorn was only 40 cents, mm. plain, and uh, buttered, the real butter we used to put on the popcorn, we used to melt the bricks into the machine, and uh, we had real buttered popcorn, and uh, that was, uh, it was 35 cents, and then it went up to 40, and then we had a square box, ah, that's all for about a quarter, plain, and on weekends we only had the big cup that sold for 30 cents, plain all butter, it was the same mm. price. Uh, it's hard to believe that we used to do a lot of business in the candy stand because I remember one time in 73 when we played Sounder, we did a big business on Sunday of $1,000, and that's a lot of 15 cent, 30 cent candy to get to that amount, $1,000. So That was the popular movie, right? right. The children's movie? No, well, well, Sounder was a very popular movie at the time. Uh, Cicely Tyson won the uh, Academy Award, I believe, for that performance. Oh. And uh, that was a very busy Sunday that we had prior to a holiday. And the co-feature was the Planet of the Apes film. One of the conquests of the Planet of the Apes, I think, was playing with it. So that, of course, helped bring a lot of people in. Hmm. And, of course, a lot of money was spent on the candy stand. But the busiest picture of all was Cry of the Wild, a true story about wolves. Uh -huh. And that played with Bigfoot. And the Renata was normally, uh, you know, an average theater that would do five, 6,000 people a week. And that was six, exactly 6,000 because they paid a dollar and less. And then we had weeks that we would go up to 8,000 people would attend our theater. Unfortunately, we attracted people that went to the Flatbush Avenue theaters. So the first run theaters on Flatbush Avenue didn't care for us that much because. If people waited, they could see what was playing on Flatbush a couple of weeks, three weeks later. You know what I mean? So we became sort of a, a, a thorn on their side because people waited and they didn't go to the first run on Flatbush Avenue. Oh, but you were, explain that called first run. Okay, when the movies opened up, they usually open up exclusively, let's say at Radio City Music Hall, the art couple would open up. Uh -huh. And it would play an uh, X number of weeks. Of course, our couple broke all records at the Radio City Music Hall, so it played like a massive 12 weeks with a stage show. Wow. And if you went there during matinees uh, in 1968, you would have paid 99 cents before 12 noon to see a stage show and the art couple first run. What's the stage show? Uh, an extravagant stage show like The Glory of Easter. The, the, the Rockets Christmas Spectacular. Oh. That was part of the show that contained also a movie. Oh, wow. And if you went in before 12 noon, the price was 99 cents. And they, how long was the show for? Uh, the show would last approximately three hours. Radio City used to try to book movies that were like an hour and 45 minutes, two hours, and the stage show was an hour. Wow, that sounds fun. And it was much fun because I remember taking my sister when she was old enough in 1974 was Disney's 50th anniversary uh -huh. and they had a whole big Disney show on stage with Mary Poppins coming down from the uh, on okay. wires and, and, and everything 
long before there was a Mary Poppins play, long before Disney put their shows on live on stage. So it was called 50 Happy Years, and the movie was, uh, I believe it was a Disney movie, it was Mary Poppins that was playing, and that was the first time Radio City Musical ever played a movie second run because it was a, an anniversary. Oh, okay. Because Radio City was spectacular, exclusive. Any movie that played Radio City Music Club could not play a 50-mile radius of radius, uh, of, uh, uh, play the movie in a 50-mile radius. They had the whole market sort of covered. Wow. And that was first run. Then, on the second run, they would play either the RKO circuit or okay. the low circuit, meaning that after the run was over, let's say on Thursday, the following Wednesday, we'd open up at Showcase Theaters. Showcase Theaters were a, a step above neighborhood theaters is that they played the films first in the borough, and they charged about 225 250 adults, and then the kids were about 75 cents at the time. And they would play two, three weeks, depending on how good the picture was. Sometimes not all pictures played that long because they were bad and played only a week and then they usually had a double. Whenever they had a double feature, you knew the pictures were not that great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that, and another week, uh, the picture would go away and then it would come back to neighborhood theaters and it would play about 30 to 40 Brooklyn theaters would be the neighborhood theaters that people would go to. That showcase run was only four or five theaters. So as it spread into the neighborhoods, 30 theaters would be playing The Detective, The Rosemary's Baby, Yours, Mine, and Ours, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the Granada was able to go because by that time they knew what the hits were so they could play all the big hits and the lesser hits and the movies that were first run that were not so great would be added onto the bottom of the bill. Oh, uh, okay. So it would always be a little feature. And on Saturday nights, we saw the single feature because people had a habit of going in and not coming out. <laughs> because they stayed in there all day. Right. Because they wanted the air conditioning and they wanted the heat. You have to remember, when I was growing up, air conditioning was a novelty. You know, there was no air conditioning in homes. There was, uh, and the movies were a novelty also because they were in color. Most, you know, until 1973, I had a black, we had black and white TVs. Because when I worked at the Granada, I had saved enough money to buy my own color television, uh, you know, for my room. Right. Because we, you know, so, you know, things that we take for granted today were actually luxury, luxuries back then. Right. Yeah. And I, I remember the old theaters were plush carpeting, and, and the seats were like soft, and they were padded with cotton or whatever. They was thick. We sat in those seats, and we just relaxed. In those days, we had to sit in the children's section, guarded by a matron with a white dress and flashlight. We were not allowed to sit anywhere we wanted. The matrons were responsible for all the children that were 16 and under, or 15 and under, that no uh, person that's slightly demented would try anything on them. That's why they kept the children secluded from the adults, um. because there were people that were pedophiles. and wanted, you know, if, if an adult ever went into the children's section, that made him be right there yanking them out. Right, right. You know, so we were well protected in those days, which we are not, to, which children are not today. You know, it's very, you know, parents have to watch their kids. You know, we had a little more, even though it was late 60s, we had a lot, lot more liberties where we could go and not be, you know, afraid of going. You know, our pa parents weren't afraid to let you go. You know, they were glad to get you out of the house for a whole Sunday afternoon yeah. and stuff. And they knew where we were, so there was not really much of a thing. We would say, we're going to Lowe's, we'll be at this theater or that theater. Would you walk? We, Basically. we walked to all the theaters, even though the buses were 10 cents at the time. <laughs> we would save the 10 cents to get the bagel at the, the bagel store on Woodruff Avenue. And we used to get salt bagels because they most reminded us of the pretzels <laughs> and stuff. So by the time we got to move there, we were very thirsty. Um, and our soda, you know, sodas, like today you go in, you can get sizes up to 64 ounces, but in those days it was only one size cup. It was a 12-ounce drink. Right. We would get a soda with crushed ice. And crushed ice was the best because as soon as you finish the soda, you could chomp on the, all the rest of the leftover ice that was in the cup. <laughs> right. Uh, 
uh, and it was dispensed by a machine. We had no drinks being sold over the counter drinks. Oh, none really? at all. None. Hmm. Not even the, the, the kings. The kings had well, the kings might have had a coke machine uh, and a couple of flavors. But they had coke and orange. And what they used to do is mix the coke and the orange and make orange coke. And so that was very popular. You'll see that in the in in, in the tape of memoirs of the movie palace okay. because locals knew that you could have orange coke when you went to the kings uh, because they had a big bubble machine in the back that was, was you know you could see you know like you know they have the fountain drinks they have bubble right. machine oh, that, right. that, that they come the liquid goes to the top and full sound sides uh -huh. and uh, we used to have orange cokes at the kings you know. um, and what you request was much a different time movies were sort of not as serious as they are today. Not every movie had a carrying message. And most of the movies are still my favorites. When I collect movies, I collect movies from that period from 1966 to 1974, which was right through my high school years. And uh, those are the movies that I love that I still watch today, you know. And everything, everything that's current, I'm not saying that they don't make good movies nowadays, but everything is too heavy-handed and not light enough for children audiences. We didn't have those big kids' movies that they have today where a, a movie opened up like uh, Little Mermaid and did you know, phenomenal business and stuff like that. And we all went to the movies from the ages of seven and under. There was no such thing. I don't remember going to the movies under seven years old. We never went. If we did go, we were babies, and we don't remember any of that stuff and stuff. That we didn't, we didn't have that. We had the Disney movies, but they were sort of, you know, evolved by that time. They were a little more grown up, you know. The, you know, you always knew we more Disney to kiss. That's about it. <laughs> you know, the love interests in the movie. Right, right. Um, but we had nothing to worry about that, and uh, all the theaters were good. You know. You know, with the M movies, we were still able to get into them. Those, those darn R-rated movies that used to play at the Astor, and the Astor was the Farm Film House, and that was one of the theaters that I spent less time in. The Astor was located next to uh, Erasmus Hall High School. Mm -hmm. It opened up as a newsreel in 1933, and then about in the 1940s, when radios and televisions came more into popularity. They switched over to a foreign film policy, which lasted from, I would say, the 40s to about 1972. And uh, I spent plenty of lunchtime hours, you know, waiting for classes to start in front of the Astor, where the fence of the Rasmus Hall is. I used to lean against that fence and just watch people go into the movies mm -hmm. uh, for 45 minutes so we had lunch break. Of course, at Erasmus Hall was one of the first schools, only schools that would allow their students to leave the campus to have lunch. Mm -hmm. And that was fabulous. That was great freedom. Because all the others had to eat the school lunches. Right. So with my little job, I was able to go to the movies, afford lunches uh, on school days. I didn't have to brown bag it because I hated sandwiches wrapped in baggies and stuff. I hated it. Where would you go to lunch? What are some of the, you mentioned, um, what is it? Uh, Woolworth chocolate nuts. Yes, we had uh, nearby the school. We had uh, various uh, eateries that were popular at the time, like Jan's Ice Cream Parlor, which had a fantastic lunch menu that cost ninety nine cents and it was like eating a meal. And I used to eat there a lot because I never went home after school. I always went to the Granada and hung out because I worked there and I hung out with the people. I would watch movies over until I knew the dialogues. And I did my schoolwork exactly after school, like between 3 and 4.30 or 5 o'clock. I'd be upstairs in the, in, the, in the mezzanine area doing my homework and I would dump like 5. And then the doorman used to go to dinner about between 5 and 6, so I would watch the door out of uniform. And uh, so while he was eating his dinner. And I hung out with the, 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 we had a family atmosphere, the staff and employees of the theater, where uh, most of the women were older in the box office, so, you know, 
big play. My grandmothers and I had all the doormen were older, so they were my grandfathers. Every I was getting advice from everybody. Oh, uh, really? You know, growing up, and you know, one cashier taught me how to shop. You know, she says you go to the store and look for things on sale. And so if there was something special on sale, where the sale day started, every day after school, I would go and shop for her. The same things every day. So she would build up her stock at home. What was she buying? Huh? What did she buy when she went uh, Whatever was on sale. She, I used to remember buying the, the uh, haddock fillets that came frozen in a box, <laughs> and which was her favorite you know, fish uh, that her husband liked. Had it fillets, and then I also remember buying um, uh, a fish that was in brine, uh, uh, a white sort of vinegary herrings. Mm -hmm. They could be, I think, they could be herrings and stuff like that. And I used to buy that and butter and things like that that you know it was on sale, you know, for ludicrous prices, you know, thirty nine cents a pound. So she would send you out? I, I would come after her? school and she would give me the list and I would go and shop. And she said, those are the items that you're going to get the whole week from me and stuff. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and now on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and Monday and Tuesday, I'd go and pick up her sale items and stuff. Where'd you go to a supermarket? And that taught me how to save a lot of money, believe it or not, in my really? later years. So they all taught me valuable lessons. And I, I, I can hear them even up to today and see them. A lot of them have gone already and uh, I have wonderful memories about working there. I miss all the people and uh, I was in touch with a couple of people that you know were ushers at the time and uh, it was my best job as a child, kid and I had a few of them, you know, including the butcher shop, I also worked at a candy store and uh, but that didn't last long in the candy store. Uh, it's not because I ate all can kind of candy, but you know, I, it was, it was, I you know, they used to make great meatball heroes too. But I, I was always addicted to those meatball heroes, and I had to leave. Otherwise, I would have been <laughs> big. But uh, but uh, we had those kind of stores, and then on top of shaving, like I said, lunchtime we had shreds. We had chock full of nuts. Chock full of nuts was also one of my favorites because that was basically I could get a Coke, a hot dog, and a shoestring french fries for 50 cents for all three items and then a quarter tip for the girls. So the girls who worked the counters, and there were about eight counters that ran like this down the whole store, narrow store. And uh, one day I was like curious and stuff because I heard a lot of people ordering their favorite sandwich, which was uh, date nut bread with cream cheese. So I tried it and I was hooked ever since on that date nut and cream cheese. And to this day I have never tasted it since I left high school in 74. <laughs> um, all these stores, of course, are now gone with the wind. You can say that uh, Starbucks is sort of the new chock full of nuts, but uh, the prices are, again, tenfold or fifteenfold the prices of coffee in 1974, which were 15 cents a cup <laughs> with a refill. And, and they said chock full of nuts was the heavenly coffee, so, <laughs> and everybody was always busy, and all the school kids used to go in there, and we loved it. They took the hot dogs off the grills, and, and when those waitresses saw me coming, they said, they were waiting to grab me and throw me on the stool because they knew I was worth a quarter to them. And believe me, I think people were, were very serious about you know their tips and everything like that. Even I, even I when I got the quarter tip, and sometimes the, the better customers on the block I lived on, who I delivered to, who knew me, used to tip me 50 cents. So it was great. And during the holiday times, it was like even being a postman because they would tip me a dollar. <laughs> so that was, you know, Christmas time, I, I, could, I, I had almost like $40, you know, just in tips from like regular customers. So that was wonderful. And I got to meet a lot of people. And uh, uh, I had a bicycle, I delivered the orders on bicycles. So why, um, like these days, people go to the supermarket to buy meat, but back then, Back then, we had every store had its own specialty. We used to have a fish store. We used to have uh, a butcher shop. We used to have a deli. 
We had a, we'd have a pizza shop. We'd have bakeries. We used to have brands, the uh, dry cleaners, which was a, a chain of dry cleaning stores, and their signs were always in orange with their names spelled in script, and then it had this sort of like uh, silvery uh, thing that would look like a dress, you know, it was all beaters that the sign in, in, in the wind would just, you know, flicker oh, uh, in the Rand stores, so we had uh, things, and then we had Evinger's Bakeries, uh, who had, which had stores all over the place, and they had best jelly donuts, and Barbara Streisand says they had the best blackout cakes ever, which I, is quite true. And uh, this is when this is when Brooklyn supported. You know, there was factories to support Brooklyn. You know, Ebinger's located right here on Albemarle Road in Rogers Avenue. That's where they baked all the Ebinger's products, and then they shipped them out to the stores. Mm. Where I live, uh, by near Empire Boulevard and Flatbush, was the Bond Bed Bread Factory. And I remember plenty of days going to school and smelling the, the whiffs of bread in the streets because the factory, it, it just, the, the, the bread smell spilled down into the streets and you could smell the bread being baked. My brother went to a school, uh, went to a school uh, up in, uh, also up on Empire Boulevard and there was a spice factory nearby that bottled spices and he could smell all the spices coming from the factory. So, and basically that they, they produced, Brooklyn produced their food, they, you know, you know, they had their bakeries, they had their everything, you know, it, it was really unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, a period of, a, a golden period of, you know, things for a kid to grow up and do and we had bowling alleys, we had corner candy stores where we could go in and play game machines, buy a piece of candy. The, the candy stores became our hangouts. Um, you know, and there was never this thing of never having anything to do today, like there is today, and you know, and there was never a time when there was no, the, well now there's a time where we don't have any theaters or any bowling alleys or any corner candy store shops, you know, all of that is, is gone with the wind, and it hasn't been replaced with anything to entertain the young at heart. The, the, the people that are young today are missing so much, you know, out of the experiences of life. They may have all their computers and Game Boys and everything, but they're not enjoying life, witnessing life as uh, being part of it. They're, you know, they're only sitting in front of a gadget. Thank God, the only gadgets we had in those days was a transistor radio mm -hmm. that we would buy for two ninety nine, and that's how we listened to WMCA, William D. Williams, uh, uh, Murray the K, the DJs at the time, and stuff like that. We used to play on radios. That, that, that was the only gadget that we had, and it was enough. And uh, all our games were, you know, games that we played on the street, you know, the girls were jumping rope, and we were playing, boys were playing skelly. Whenever we'd have a rainstorm, we'd have, have our popsicle sticks. We'd go to uh, uh, Rogers and Nostrand, and the street was basically coming down slightly on an incline, so all the water rushed. So three of us would put our popsicle sticks, and then we'd see which popsicle stick would win the race to the end of the block and fall down the sewer. So uh, we'd follow the whole stick down the block, and then after we, if we really had a really downpour, it was really great because those sticks used to go flying down. You know, we'd have to run up and down the streets a couple of times. You mentioned uh, the DJs. So what kind of music were you listening to? We were listening to all the popular Motown tunes of, of the day. Um, I can remember. Motown, Motown was very popular. Right? Those are the songs that are the, the Supremes. You know, we were, uh, as a young kid, you know, at home we were weaned on TV variety shows. So we were watching Red Skelton, Dean Martin, uh, uh, Jackie Gleason. Every night there would be a popular uh, uh, host of Red Skelton. Uh, 
we perform the hat at night and we watch music musical programs and the musical programs became part of what we listened to on the radio and it was all the Supremes and all these songs so when I so when I hear a song I tell my niece to raise it up she says oh that's a nice song I says yeah I was born when I was about 12 when it came out so it's wonderful to know that you were young during a certain time when all these songs, the popular songs of the 60s were coming out right. and you were living the moment that these things were coming out and the TV shows that were coming out of the television set that were popular at the time. Right. Batman, Green Hornet, uh, Flying Nun and uh, stuff like that and uh, we would watch them, you know, but we lose a lot of television watching because my father was only a variety person show. So if, if Batman was opposite that, which it wasn't, we would miss out on Batman. We, they, they, they wouldn't let us have the TV for any, there's no remotes in those days anywhere. We had to get up and change the channel. Right. So we, we looked on, you know, it was a great time, you know, even though through all the things of the assassinations of the 60s, the two press, uh, uh, President Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy, even though the, the country was in turmoil, as a kid, we saw it, but the news media also didn't shove it down our throats to the thing, because I remember seeing all three funerals on television the following day, or when they, they had the funerals for these people, and we sat in front of the television and watched them. And basically, you know, schools were closed. We, everybody, there was only a few channels, so there was nothing to watch but that. Uh, in those days, the theaters had respect when a president was assassinated or a civil rights leader was the thing. They closed for half a day, or they would close for the whole entire day. And we don't see that. We don't see any respect for our leaders today. If you know, it, it, you know, if they die, it's business as usual the next day. You know, there's no mourning. And, you know, it was important for a country to mourn when we lose people. And uh, not that I knew that when I was a kid, but uh, uh, that's the way it was. You know, that's my recollections of, of, of that. And uh, uh, little did I know after I graduated high school in 1974, that within three years from that, 1977, that all these theaters would be gone with the sole survivor being just the Kenmore across the street from the, the uh, Dutch Reformed Church being the only operating movie house. And uh, being the only operating movie house uh, from 1983 to 1999 when they closed, uh, that they, they had to multiply the theater by four because there were so many movies and they couldn't do it with one screen so they needed four screens. And up to that time, you know, in the, the only two theaters that lasted, most of them were closed by 1977, but the Albemarle and the Granada hung in there till 1983, and then the Kenmore was the last one to close in 1999. And Flatbush has been without a movie theater for 16 years. So I'm wondering how, what, what the movie going ethics of today, you know what I mean? Because movies are, some movies are pretty good. You know, I'm not, I'm not knocking movies of today, but they certainly don't have the fun and the escapism and the comedy and the slapstick of movies of then. Today, our comedy depends on crudeness, and there's a big difference. Well, why don't we talk about the King's Theater? Since, okay. Okay, let's talk about that since it's going to be bringing okay. the theater back to Flatbush. Okay. okay. Uh, when, once the King's closed, I was very sorry to see a, a magnificent place like that being closed. So. Every so often, every year, even though I lived on Long Island, I used to come back to look at the Kings, and you know, I, I did this for many years. I watched it and kept an eye on it. Why was it so special back in the day? Why was it? It was special because it was uh, a, a theater seating 3,600 people, who ha which had seen its better days by the time I started visiting it. I started going to the Kings in its last decade of operation, mm -hmm. so it had been opened in 1929, okay. and I started going in 1966, but when you walked in there, as soon as you got to the theater and you bought your ticket, the door would be like sort of a jar, and these were heavy brass doors, and through the doors you got the smell and the aroma of theater, 
and the aroma of theater is this combination of smell of the popcorn and the air conditioning right. blending in and pushing itself. We still have that today. I smell. Yeah. You, I smell. you do? Yeah. And uh, but back then it was a, a certain smell, and the theaters that had that smell were the Kings, the Kenmore, <laughs> and the Albemarle because they popped their own popcorn. Oh. All the other theaters didn't have that because it was already pre bad but they still smelled theater. It still smelled theater. The only one that didn't smell theater was the Aster because they didn't have a candy stand. That's impossible to believe, a movie house without a candy stand. But getting back to the Kings. Yeah, how was it different than other theaters, was it? What, the Aster? The Kings. The Kings? The yeah. Kings was different because even then, being young, you could see the the work that went into this building, it was immense. The lobby was so high, you, you know, you raise your head to, to look at everything. And when you sat down, it was very dark because it came in from the light, and then your eyes started focusing on gargoyle masks looking at you and different, uh, uh, different uh, statuary that was located in the theater uh, would become more obvious to you. And it was a wonderful theater because it was single features and you go in, they'd start, they'd start at 12 o'clock as the Kings normally starting that time and the movies were always two hours apart no matter how long they are, you know, they didn't have long intermissions. And you went in there, I, I was always late because we had to eat dinner at 12, so I always got to the Kings about 12.40. So I watched the end of the movie and then watched the movie all over again, and then I would watch the beginning. They never threw us out. We were able to sit in there all day, literally from 12 to 6, without being, you know, knocked out. Um, were the movies different? Were they, was it a first it was, run? It was a first run okay. movie house. It was a first run. And then when I started seeing some first run movie houses, the movies that appealed to me, I would go, like, I was like sort of a little bit of a Disney freak until I was about 11 or 12. So I'd like to see all the Disney stuff. And that would only play on Clockwork Avenue. And uh, then as I became interested in actors and actresses, you know, like Walter Matthau and the Dark Couple, you know, and, and things like that, I would start going first run. Well, if there was a horror movie, uh, I would go first run. Where would you stuff. see those? You said they're uh, not Clappish Avenue? Clappish Avenue houses oh, okay. were all first run. Yeah, every, all five theaters were first run. Uh, the only movies that didn't appeal to me were the uh, art films, and I don't know why, because I took French in high school, but we were never taken to a movie, even though some classes were taken, they, they, because they taught German in Erasmus Hall at the time, uh -huh. they would take them to that theater for, yeah, for lessons and to learn. But the King's is, you know, was one of the most magnificent theaters and stuff, and it, at that time, it was the only Lowe's theater that I was in. Besides the Cameo, which was a Lowe's operation, but then they started selling off their, their buildings. In the 60s, the Lowe's Corporation started decimating their theater circuit and getting rid of theaters. And by the time the 70s came, they had just uh, a handful of 25 theaters and, you know, the periodically one would close and most of them all were all closed by 1977, including the Kings, because these big theaters were big to operate and the heating and the unions and, and, and the payrolls, uh, which they were not making their payrolls, they couldn't pay their film rentals because, you know, people were afraid to go out at night in the mid-70s and, uh, and, and that left a big hole in, in uh, attendance-wise for the Kings. But they had magnificent chandeliers. Uh, the help was always courteous. I remember going to the Kings one time, and they had raised the children's price from 75 to 90 cents. And me and my brother didn't have the money, and a kindly doorman, an older doorman, gave me and my brother 15 cents each so we could go see Torture Garden, the Burgess Meredith, double feature. Uh, it was a compilation of four or five horror stories. Torture Garden? Torture Garden, yeah. That took place in a circus. <laughs> and they would, you know, they would see uh, the, the vignettes, you know. The, that was popular. They made a lot of those, like Tales from the Crypt, Volk of Horror. 
they were all basic compilations of horror stories. And uh, and we had to go see, uh, the, we saw those movies basically on the first run and stuff because they had a package of torture garden seeds that they gave us that we could plant in our garden. So that's why, I, you know, they had these little things that they would give the people to you know, come this weekend and see the package of torture garden seeds. Plant them in your garden and see what grows. Oh, that's great. What were they? <laughs> I don't know. I never Whatever. planted them. I get the sad the seed pack for the longest time when my, my mom was them out. Oh, uh, okay. And even then I was a collector. You know, in those days the theaters had which they, you know, was also an attraction, stills of the movies, with actual scenes of the movies, with the poster and the scenes of our current attractions. And we were able to see the movies and the scenes. But most of the times, when we'd see the scenes outside, those scenes were really not in the movie. Really? And we were, we were sort of, what isn't that scene? But the, 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 they basically, you know, took them from different angles and stuff right. like that. Um, you know, they got the best scenes to attract the people to come in. Right. And that was being done away with, too. So that's why today I'm a collector of stills and uh, uh, other things from that period of movie going. Mm -hmm. And even things that played the Kings. I could sit here and ramble off movies that I saw at the Kings. And I remember every single one of them. Really? Let's do that, and then we'll end it on that. Okay. Then I'll have to go out. And movies that I saw at the Kings were never a dull moment with Dick Van Dyke. Doris Day's last movie, Where Were You When the Lights Went Out. I saw um, Torture Garden, uh, uh, How Sweet It Is, all the films from 1968, 69. I think one of the first movies that I saw at the Kings was What Did You Do in the War Daddy in 1966, and that was with James Colbert. And that one I went with my sister too, because that was only 10 at the time. It was only over 10 that we started going on our own. And uh, various other movies. But uh, the Kings also, at one point, they were all, always family orientated. They started showing, you know, adult fare. And I saw my supposedly first X-rated movie at the Kings in 1977 or 1976. It was a movie called Emmanuel, which was not really an X-rated movie by today's standards or by that year's standards. Right. Uh, but you know, I was able to get in without having to show proof, so that you know. Did you see a lot of musicals? Were musicals still? Musicals were very popular. Um, I saw Paint Your Wagon at the Kings, that was a musical. I remember I saw the Out of Towners. The Kings used to play a lot of movies that used to play at Radio City Music Hall. They used to go between the Kenmore and the Kings with those movies. So I saw the art couple at the Kenmore, I saw... Uh, uh, so oh, uh, after they opened at Radio City, they would come to either the right. Kenmore or the Kings because right. they were the next big. They were the next showcase. Okay. They, those were the showcase theaters hmm. that they started in 1967-68. Because basically, at one time, all those theaters played one product and all RKO played another product, and certain studios catered to both of them. Oh. And uh, and the, and you know. And, but that, and that was only one-sixth of my movie going because it was the five other theaters that I used to attend to. And I used to go to different ones all the time and stuff. But my main house was the Kings and the Granada because, you know, they, they you got more for your money at the Granada. You got two pictures and, and it was a longer show and it was closer to the house. So, you know, I was able to walk it faster. Where, is, where was the Granada? On Church Avenue between Rogers and Nostrand. It is now a Rite Aid store. Still, it's building still there. All our theaters are still intact. Not intact. I would say three of our theaters are intact in 19 uh, in 2015. Three of our theaters are intact, and three are in retail use. Um, so the ones that are intact, are they being used, or are they just? Yes, the Aldemar is the Jehovah Witnesses uh -huh. Assembly Hall. Uh, the Rialto is. Uh, at least a year, and then the Kings, which is going to have a grand reopening, is going to be a performing arts center, and that will be our true destination for shows in Flatbush. 
you know, and it's going to be a great one because it's going to be live. Okay, great.